couple of announcements to make, and I just want to alert you again that we, in, in our, um, on our website, which, what's the website? CatholicCitizens.org. There you go, CatholicCitizens.org. We, we have, you know, we're, we're much more current with our events calendar. Uh, on the opening page, we have our own speakers only, but if you click on the calendar, we're populating that now with uh, events by what we call allied organizations. Those are ones that are consistent with us, but it's not us. Uh, but we, you know, if you want to get involved with them, and, and this, there's a range of things. Some of it's somewhat political. Um, so I just want to have a couple of announcements. Two of these are on the site. Two of these I'm going to call on some people in the audience to talk about very quickly because I was just alerted to them uh, this morning. On February 13th, that Sunday, there's a Save the Latin Mass Rosary event again uh, at Holy Name. I unfortunately do not have the name of the sponsor for that. Um, who is it? Daniel Pribble. Well, Pribble. but I think there's a group. Yeah. What? Yeah. Anyway, it's on the website. I'm sure I, I will. When I get uh, back to the uh, back home, I will put a link to, to where I got it. But I know it's on Sunday, and it's uh, I believe it's at uh, noon to one. Eleven a.m. Eleven. Eleven to twelve. I know it was one hour. Um, on February 28th, the uh, Illinois Catholic Conference is having a public forum on the new Illinois abortion laws at St. Bernard's Parish in Forest Glen. Um, uh, Bob uh, Killian is, is uh, hosting that. Um, I hope there's a large turnout. I'm not quite, I'd have to look on my map to see where Forest Glen is, but, um, and I don't know why they chose that location unless it's where he lives or something. Uh, but this is a real serious issue in Illinois, and we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it now, but I encourage people to get very much uh, uh, up to speed on what's going on with that, and maybe this forum would be a good place. The other thing about going to things that Bob does, I think a lot of times, I assume, for example, if there was a huge turnout for this, that word would trickle back to the archdiocese somehow, because he obviously works for the archdiocese. Um, on the other hand, if it's a real tiny, crowd, that will probably get back too. So if, if people are interested in that issue, and I hope you all are, I urge you to uh, try to attend that. Then um, Jim Healy has an announcement to make about, I believe it's an Acton Institute event. You were going to remind me what I was supposed to say. It, it, you had an upcoming film about the gentleman in Hong Kong who's been... Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai. Yeah, very Catholic also. And we'll talk about that, and we'll have a, an outdoor barbecue, an outdoor theater, so it'll be like a date, be like a date uh, night. And we'll have more of an announcement about it at the next oh, uh, The date has not yet been set? The date has not yet been set, All right. probably sometime in late April. Well, as soon as that gets locked down, we will, we'll put it on the website, OK? okay. Um, and then. Um, Another announcement about, oh, I guess the next rosary, you want to talk about that briefly? It's, it's the, it will be a recurring rosary rally at Holy Name Cathedral the first Sunday of each month at 11 o'clock, 11 to 12. So again, we'll put that on the calendar um, now that we know that. And if you have any information you want to send, uh, okay. just send it to me. Um, I, I uh, you know, I, I have six children, several grandchildren now, and in the course of the last six months or so, I've traveled a lot to visit with them. None of them are in Chicago. I don't know what to make of that exactly. Um, but I've been to uh, Washington, D.C., Virginia, slash Virginia. Um, I've been to New Orleans, and I've been to, well, Milwaukee for that matter. and. Um, I'm incredibly struck by the amount of infrastructure building that's going on. Now, this is not a result of anything recently passed. This is what the states have been able to somehow scrape together the money to do um, since long before any of this emergency uh, relief stuff was passed. Is that Devin? Yes. <laughs> right here. Good to see you. Devin Jones, everybody. I don't know. Many of you probably know Devin. 
Uh, and yet, and yet, you know, Washington has been totally absorbed about all this money that has to be, you know, sent to the states for uh, COVID relief. Um, with the COVID, it's the same lesson. We have all these experts contradicting themselves now, while normal people are out figuring things out pretty much for themselves and, and acting accordingly and changing things. Uh, the truckers, whoever thought truckers in Canada would be leading the way <laughs> on something like this, but they are, they are. Uh, I heard someone, by the way, talking about the, the, the March for Life and what and a tremendous, well, it was Bob, um, our speaker attended, many of you attended. Um, if you've never done that, you've got to do it. That's another, just an incredible movement and incredibly young people uh, that you see doing that. Not, not entirely, but you know, to, to see the media reports, almost nobody turns up. To see the media reports, you think the anti or the pro-abortion people are equal in numbers. To see the media coverage, you think that every other person there was either a nun or a priest. None of that is true. These are, these are just wonderful events. My ultimate point is, this, this stuff is not gonna be solved by some bureaucrat in Washington. The things that we're concerned about are not gonna be solved by some bureaucrat or agency in Washington. It's not gonna be solved by the Supreme Court, ultimately. We're in a nice place on that right now, but a couple of deaths and the whole thing could flip. Um, and it's not gonna be saved by Rome. It's gonna be saved by people like us doing what we need to do at the very local level. And that frankly begins at the domestic church in our families. We've got to get our act together at that level and then you know, move up to whatever level we're comfortable working at to do it. And to do that, you've got to have good information. You've got to know what you're talking about. It, it's not going to be solved with confrontation. It's going to be solved by changing hearts and minds. And so I encourage you, I mean, to me, it just reinforces the need for our mission. I don't know of any other group that quite hits the notes that we hit. There's things like Catholic Vote that do what they do. Um, there's all these pro-life groups that do what they do, and, and you know, we're like this. But this, I think, this organization is unique. That's why I've been involved as long as I have been. I uh, applaud Marianne Hackett, as always, um, for coming up with this whole thing. <laughs> Thrilled to see her here, by the way. We always are grateful for her coming out. Um, but, but it's just, you know, keep it simple. We do what we do. We do our website. We do our banquets. We try to get speakers in here. The more, by the way, and this is ultimately a pitch for financial support, of course, but the more financial support we get, the better speakers we can get. And I think uh, you'll see our speaker today is, is uh, proof of that. Um, so anyway, um, very encouraged. In, in a way by what's going on in the country, very encouraged by this turnout. Thank you all for coming, and now I'll ask Father Finelli, who's about to fall asleep listening to my remarks, <laughs> to come up and offer a, a blessing. Thank you. Well, let's start with the Angelus, shall we? Yes. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The angel Lord declare unto Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And the word made flesh. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Let us pray, pour forth your beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, made by his passion and cross, be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Anybody know what today is? Our Lady of Lourdes. Our Lady of Lourdes. Thank you very much. Anybody here got took the bath at uh, Our Lady of Lourdes? Hey, look at this over there. Tremendous. Tremendous. Great. Great. Me too. I, 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 they, they have you stripped down and then they put a, 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 a towel around your pirate parts and then doom. Zoom down into the water. Oh, so cold. But when you get up, you're, you're okay, you know. 
And uh, I had sciatica at that time. What did I learn? Don't complain. <laughs> <laughs> so let's pray to Our Lady of Lourdes, huh? Let's say the, uh, let's say the, uh, the memorari, huh? Remember, O oh, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection implored thy help or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despise not my petition, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. Amen. Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. Our speaker today, Robert Riley, is the director of the Westminster Institute. Bob served as special assistant to President Reagan and President Trump, and as a director of the Voice of America. He was also senior advisor for information strategy to the Secretary of Defense and taught at the National Defense University. He attended George, uh, Georgetown University and the Claremont Graduate School. He's published widely on American politics and morals, foreign policy, and classical music. Um, among his books, and I say among because there's literally several more, but these are some of the highlights. The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist Crisis. The one that I first learned of him about, it's called Making Gay Okay, How Rationalizing Homosexual Behavior is Changing Everything. And he actually spoke at a, a luncheon uh, of ours in 2015 on that topic was absolutely superb. Surprised by Beauty, a listener's guide to the recovery of modern music, and most recently, America on Trial, a defense of the founding. Uh, that was just published last year. I present to you Robert Riley. Kevin, thank you very much. <clears throat> Having been born and raised in Chicago, who'd think you'd have to come to Lombard for a taste of freedom? <laughs> but here we are, happy to be here, too. Um, by the way, uh, Kevin, that book, Making Gay Okay, has embarrassed any number of clerical friends of mine who've read it on planes, trains, and someone glances down they're in their collar and they say, making gay okay, and immediately <laughs> the conversation with those nearby uh, looking straight ahead. They, and here is my daughter, Catherine, who, who came up with the name of that book as we were tossing around names in the kitchen one night when she was just a teenager. Dad, it's about making gay okay but we need a subtitle. <laughs> now, Rash, and, and thank you for giving the subtitle, Kevin. That was very good. Um, so my daughter, Catherine, moved here, and she teaches in parochial school. And several weeks ago, she called me and said, Dad, it's five degrees. And we had been having a heat wave in Northern Virginia. I think we were up to 27 degrees. And I thought, I've got to get back to Chicago and cool off. <laughs> so that's just uh, great to be here. Um, now I'm going to tell you that I'm extremely delighted to be speaking on the feast day of Our Lady of Lourdes because the Riley family is under her protection. She is our sponsor for many, many years. Uh, my sister, whom I, I hoped it would be with us, she's recovering from an operation, she lives nearby in Oak Brook, gave me that devotion many years ago when I don't know what kind of trouble I had gotten myself into. She said, go to Our Lady of Lords. I did. And, and I've, I've never come back. And uh, there's a church very near where I worked for years at the Voice of America, St. Dominic's, which has a shrine to Our Lady of Lourdes. And sometimes uh, we'll go drive from Northern Virginia into downtown DC so we can attend that church and pay a visit to our great Lady of Lourdes. So I, I'm, I'm delighted that I'm speaking on, on uh, her feast day. Anyway, 
Um, you'll all be familiar with this. From Lewis Carroll through the looking glass. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. Well, that's about it, any questions? <laughs> Now, well, Lewis Carroll got it. I mean, that's, that's the nub of the thing. I went uh, back to school last semester, Catholic University graduate school. My dear friend, Monsignor Robert Sokolowski was teaching a course on Aristotle's metaphysics. Father Sokolowski is, is 87, been teaching at Catholic U for more than 50 years, and at other universities before that. So uh, luckily I was able to audit via Zoom so people wouldn't wonder, what's this geezer doing in our class? Because the rest of them were graduate students, and I'm sure there was 50 years between my age and the next oldest person in the room, aside from Father Sokolovsky. But it was brilliant. It was a treat of a lifetime to have this great philosopher <laughs> Uh, explicate Aristotle's metaphysics. And it pertains to our subject tonight because Aristotle makes very clear in the metaphysics the, the relationship between words and reality. That there's no separation. The, the words capture the reality. What you have when you name something is an understanding of the essence of the thing named. In other words, that for which it is and how it is. So the word and the thing are joined at the hip. Well, he told a very interesting story. He was musing about a conference, multidisciplinary conference to which he had been. And in Whatever he was talking about, he alluded to the fact that, uh, well, that the tree is real. And a, a woman scientist went into high dudgeon over his effrontery and making the statement that the tree is real. And she scolded him and said, quote, a tree is a signification we project on the other. Do you have that? The tree is a signification that we project on the other. In other words, the origin of that thing, uh, this, this idea that this tree is real, is in Father Sokolovsky's mind. It's not out there. And how he had the effrontery to say the tree is real. How could he possibly know that? So I thought, oh, I wish you would ask that woman whether she was real or whether she was simply a signification that you had placed upon her. I mean, how, 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 how crazy can, can this be? Well, we'll find out, it gets a lot crazier. So there you go. Um, now there's an Iranian writer in exile here in the US, Mandanipur. I just happened to come across this quote the other day, quote, when defenseless language is being abused to fabricate lies, one must write to prove that the word tree means tree. Go figure. How? So now Kevin said that I had been an advisor to President Trump, which is not true. I, I was a special assistant to President Reagan many years ago. But I did, a year ago, December, take a kamikaze run back into the federal government as the director of the Voice of America, a position I had served in uh, years before, 2001, 2002. This is an agency of some 1,300 people. And uh, I went to the very handsome building on Independence Avenue 
There was nobody there. I did find a, the newsroom, empty, nobody there. How do you? I went to the, do you remember the Vincent Price movie, The Last Man on Earth? Yeah. He wakes up in his house and goes out into the city. He says, no, no, everybody's gone. Well, that was my experience returning to federal government. So I, I found an office manager and one other woman and queried them as to where people might be. And she answered, well, they have self-identified <laughs> as vulnerable to COVID. The other woman nodded, yep, that's it. They've self-identified as vulnerable. I said, well, aren't there objective criteria by which you could judge whether you're vulnerable, like prior medical conditions or something like that? No, it's a self, self-identified as vulnerable. I said, oh, I see. OK. Do I uh, have a secretary? Yes. Uh, where is she? Well, she, she self-identified as vulnerable. <laughs> I said, OK, well, what's she doing? <clears throat> well, she's working from home. I said, working for, I haven't given her any work to do, so what, what work might she be doing? Well, I guess she's self-identified as working from home. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just, uh, yeah. Well, we know the, the philosophical relationship, the metaphysical relationship between words and reality from from Aristotle, which was then picked up and enriched by Thomas Aquinas and others. And St. Thomas, of course, said that we can know things because they are a product of logos, or reason. You remember the beginning of the Gospel of St. John? In the beginning was the word logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos it was God. All things are made through him as logos. Logos means word or reason. So when we see the world imbued with a rational order, and the fact that our minds can apprehend that rational order, that's why. Things that have been created by reason can be thought about. And when we think about them, we assign to them words. And here's how the process works. I'm going to refer to one of the great French Thomist philosophers, Etienne Gilson. This is one of the most beautiful things anyone has written about what happens when we're using words, when we're speaking them in relationship to reality. Quote, man alone has been created with a knowing mind and a loving heart in order that, by knowing and loving all things in God, he might refer them to their origin, which is at the same time their end. His essential function is to lend his voice to an otherwise speechless creation, to help each thing in publicly confessing its deepest and most secret meaning, or rather its essence. For each of them is a word, while man alone can say it, unquote. This beautiful reflection means that each existing thing is the result of logos, the word of God. But man is the only creature in the universe that can speak the word that each thing is. God knows through his creation of things. As we know from Genesis, he spoke things into being. He spoke creation into being. Someone even suggests he sang it into being, which is a very lovely thought. Nonetheless, singing would be worth words. So when God said, let there be light, there was light. Now man, on the other hand, in speaking names, has this dim perception of the knowledge that God used to create it in the first place. The only other creature in the universe 
that can in that way participate in God's creative knowledge is man when man looks and says, light. And when man names all these things, he comes to know them in some way dimly as God knew them when he brought them forth. How is that for the significance of language? And then, of course, as we go a little further into St. John's Gospel, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that Word, the Word becomes incarnate, which sanctifies creation all the more so, becomes all the more sacred. Words were already sacred, but now that the Word itself has become incarnate. Think of the significance of that. The integrity of language now has a supernatural sanction because of the word incarnate. So, the assault on the integrity of words is driven by something that the great philosopher of the 20th century, Eric Vogelin, called Gnosticism. He speaks of this as a, a spiritually pathological, magical reconstruction of reality <clears throat> or a second reality. Let's create another, just a separate reality. <clears throat> Vogelin wrote that, quote, in the Gnostic dream world, non-recognition of reality is the first principle. As a consequence, types of action which in the real world would be considered as morally insane because of the real effects which they would, which they would have will be considered moral in the dream world. The gap between the intended and the real effect will be imputed not to the Gnostic immorality of ignoring the structure of reality, but to the immorality of some other person or society that does not behave as it should behave according to the dream conception. You all familiar with this? The interpretation of moral insanity as morality is a confusion difficult to unravel. The obsession of replacing the world of reality with a transfigured dream world has become the obsession of the one world in which the dreamers adopt the vocabulary of reality while changing its meaning as if the dream were a reality. This is what we're living in now. Uh, we are accosted by a dream world or a second reality constructed by um, all of the allies of the alphabet disorders. There are too many LGBTQ, DBUB, et cetera, et cetera, plus sign, who insist that any discomfort they feel, uh, any kind of alienation they feel is a product of our having uh, produce that in them. So what needs to be changed is not themselves, it's we who need to be changed, and we need to be brought into conformity with the dream world which they have constructed. And the demand, their demand, is that we accede to this dream world and that we comply with it and pretend along with them uh, that it's real, which makes us, of course, complicit in the damage that it does and the profound immorality in which it's engaged. So Machiavelli clarified uh, wh what's going on with this kind of thing in his discourses. Quote, when it happens that the founders of the new religion speak a different language, the destruction of the old religion is easily effected. Uh, so the Machiavellian revolutionary must inculcate new ways of thinking and speaking that amount to a new language. In discourses upon language, Machiavelli 
compared using one's own language to infiltrate the enemy's thoughts with Rome's use of its own troops to control allied armies. So it's using that military analogy, we can pretty much uh, see how, how it's going and how it's operating. And I'm sure you're familiar with that in this organization of the assaults under which you have uh, suffered because you insist on speaking the truth. Now, in the, the uh, Kevin, did you give the title of the lecture? Oh, well, what am I supposed to speak on? <laughs> this is what I was thinking of, so I thought I'd share it. But I think in the, the title you said the perversion of language and the damage it's done or something like that, again. Right. Implying that this is not the first time uh, the, the world has dealt with this Gnostic, the imposition of this second reality, this dream world. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. And I'll briefly allude to the two major ones from the 20th century, Marxism, Leninism, to begin with. So Lenin made explicit, quote, the scientific concept of dictatorship means neither more or less than unlimited power resting directly on force not limited by anything, not restrained by any laws or any absolute rules, nothing else but that. Therefore, he, along with Marx and the, well, Marx and the Communist Manifesto said communists, quote, openly declare that their ends can only be attained by the forcible overthrow of all existing institutions. Lenin again, quote, everything is moral which is necessary for the annihilation of the old exploiting order, unquote. Well, we know uh, from Marxist-Leninist speak what, what he was talking about because it was a class theory of history. So Marxism was to rescue the proletariat through the dictatorship of the proletariat and liquidate the bourgeoisie and the upper classes and the kulaks, et cetera. But if, if you've ever had to read Marxist-Leninist text, which I had to do as a foot soldier in the Cold War and spent much of my life uh, in that capacity, against the Soviet Union, you know this, this doublespeak in which this, this dream language that they use. So Lenin called for purging the Russian land of all kinds of harmful insects, of which it turns out there were tens of millions redefined into insects of all kinds. Now one uh, very notable person whom I had the privilege to meet during the last days of the Soviet Union was Alexander Yakovlev. He was a member of the Politburo. He was second to Gorbachev. After the Soviet Union fell, this man had a turning of the soul. I don't think Gorbachev ever did, but Yakovlev certainly did. And he became very active at the a Commission for the Rehabilitation of the Victims of Political Repression in Russia, concentrating especially on what was done to religious communities. So this happened because of a misuse of language, because of the Marxist-Leninist redefinition, which made religion the enemy and here, as Yaakov Led says, approximately 200,000 clergy were killed during the 60 years of communist rule in the Soviet Union. Another 500,000 religious figures were persecuted, 40,000 churches destroyed, half the country's mosques and more than half the synagogues were also destroyed. I'm quoting from Yaakov Lev here. Clergymen were crucified on church's holy gates, shot, scalped, and strangled. I was especially shocked by accounts of priests turned into columns of ice in winter.
Building on the maxim that religion is the opium of the people, Lenin gave the order to carry out a campaign of merciless terror against priests, etc., etc. So, right, that gives us just a little insight into what happens uh, with the abuse of language and its transformation into a second reality, which is then forcibly imposed upon reality with terrible consequences. Now, I have been reading a, the diaries of Victor Klemperer, who was a Jew who survived his entire time in Nazi Germany, miraculously. He was married to a Christian. He, I, he may have converted. How, in any, he was a professor of philology, so he studied language. He, of course, was dismissed from the university. His, his diaries are called, I Will Bear Witness. I Will Bear Witness, a diary of the Nazi years. And so there you go, from 1933 to 1945, two huge volumes, which I avidly read because you get at the granular level how the Nazi ideology has seeped down into society, transforming everything. Grocery stores, department stores, obviously the media, how people dress, what were they were able to say. After the war, he wrote another book called um, The Language of the Third Reich, a seminal work analyzing the language that was used. And how was that? And Klemperer says, he writes, it isn't only Nazi actions that have to vanish, but also the Nazi cast of mind, the typical Nazi way of thinking, and its breeding ground, the language of Nazism. You all know this so well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but let's just, I'll, I'll refer you to a statement by Adolf Hitler that he made as early as 1923. Quote, the Jew is certainly a race, not human. He cannot be human in the sense of the image of God. Poof. Go six million people because of this abuse of language. They cannot be human. By the way, what was Hitler doing? How had he thought of his race theory of history that parallels the class theory of history that the communists had. Where did he come up with this? He would have told you at the time, indeed, he said it time and again, whether it was in Mein Kampf or his, his dinner table conversations recorded in table talk or his many speeches. He was following the science. Follow the science. And what was the science he was following? Darwinianism. Survival of the fittest the struggle for survival, blended with modern day eugenics, some of which he got from this country. He was read in some of the books that were justifying uh, eugenics, eliminating the unfit. And of course, he installed his program to do precisely that uh, well before the camps opened to eliminate the Jews and to enslave the Slavs. He was following the science. The Aryans were the ones to win the Darwinian struggle to the top as the fittest, and they would prove they were fittest by eliminating the unfit and not letting anybody who was uh, less fit than they to pollute their bloodstream. So 1935, Right, he becomes chancellor in 33. 35, they pass the Nuremberg Laws, stripping Jews of their citizenship and prohibiting the marriage of a Jew to a non-Jew. Then Crystal knocked the burning of the synagogues and then, you know, the whole uh, horror show uh, begins. 
And by the way, Hitler is very clear. No, this is not an emotional thing. This is not driven by sentiment. It's reason. This is the reasonable thing to do. This is the rational thing to do. This is what's required by science. You see, when you invert language, you try to invert reality, and you dehumanize anyone who doesn't fit within your new definition. And uh, there you go. Now, by that time in 1935, what was one to do? Uh, the southern part of Germany, of course, was heavily Catholic. There were many courageous Protestants, Martin Niemöller, and uh, of course the great Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who paid for his opposition with his life. But what about the guy in the street? What about you? What, what, do, what do you do when something like this happens? Well, we lost that one. We'll just, you know, continue on the best we can. To see, you know, it's just this one thing. Too bad for the Jews. No, too bad for you. That was just the start. The semantic infiltration was going to seize your mind, and you had better conform to it. You had better rally to it. Uh, and uh, you had better be changed by it. And we all know the consequences of the ultimate cost of that. 30 million people, World War II. Well, OK. We know from these historical examples, uh, whether then or now, the strategy of attrition is the same. We're down through the repetition of the big lie or lies, right? It's very amusing, this comedian, Dave Ch Chappelle, <laughs> did you ever heard of him? I had no idea who he was until the dust up over his Netflix special when he said, <laughs> quote, I know that trans people make up words to win arguments. This is a real thing, unquote. Indeed, <laughs> indeed it is. And I would say the, 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 the challenge of the trans people seems to come right out of a Groucho Marx movie. <laughs> there was a scene in which Chico was caught in a bald-faced lie, confronted with the evidence that he had just lied. And his comeback was to say, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? <laughs> the trans version of this is, who are you going to believe, me or my lying chromosomes? Because the boy actually still is a boy, and the girl is actually still a girl, though you will be suborned into uh, admitting the opposite of that truth. Now, well, what about the metaphysics underlying this transmogrification and this corruption of language and this uh, creation of the second reality? Where did that come from? We know where Aristotle and Aquinas came from and where Etienne and Jusson came from, the metaphysics of reality. Well, what are the metaphysics of unreality? I know you've all heard of, of the great Stalinist uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. His paramour was Simone de Beauvoir, uh, who asserted that nothing, nothing has an a priori identity. Quote, the basis of existentialism is precisely that there is no human nature. Ha! Huh. There's no human nature, and thus, no feminine nature. Therefore, she said so presciently, quote, the mammary glands that develop at puberty have no role in the woman's individual economy. They can be removed at any moment in her life." Unquote. When reality disappears, <laughs> poof, 
a woman's breasts disappear. Like magic, right? De Beauvoir insisted, nature, quoting again, nature is not something given. How can this be? How can anything be anything if it hasn't a nature? If nothing has an a priori identity and nothing is given, why would surgery be necessary to change it? Okay. Well, the authority of nature could not be more directly or aggressively contravened than by the surgical assault against it. Suffering from what one is by nature, which is what these poor trans people experience, they're suffering from what they are by nature, the transgender person strikes back like a slasher against an attacker. Only when the attack is over can it be seen as having been against oneself. Which is why, according to Walt Heyer, who underwent such a surgery, quote, 41% attempt suicide. Well, you see the inherent logic of this, do you not? What is transgender surgery is a partial suicide. A woman suicides her femininity, a man commit suicide of his masculinity, and many of them are disposed to finish the job. 90% have significant forms of psychopathology. 61% also have other psychiatric disorders and illnesses. 50% have depressive symptoms. 40% showed symptoms of anxiety. No wonder. Metaphysical contradiction leads to self-contradiction, even to self-annihilation. What is left is still a woman or a man, but now horribly mutilated. It is in the gender abattoir that we can see what this truly is a revolt against being. Now, in Virginia, uh, this is mandated in the schools. Uh, it's promoted in the schools. A young man in Loudoun County, which is south of Fairfax County, where I live, was a teacher. He's apparently an evangelical Christian. His name is Tanner Cross. He refused to comply. He was told that this girl in his class had transitioned and was now a boy, and he was to change pronouns and fall into line. He refused to do it. So let me read you what this man in his 20s, the statement he issued. Quote, it is not my intention to hurt anyone, but there are certain truths that we must face. We condemn school policies that would damage children, defile the holy image of God. I love all of my students, but I will never lie to them regardless of the consequences. I'm a teacher, but I serve God first and I will not affirm that a biological boy can be a girl and vice versa because it's against my religion. It's lying to a child, it's abuse to a child, it's sinning against God, unquote. Tanner Cross had his Thomas More moment and he passed it. He, of course, was placed on leave. But as one consequence of what he did and the stir it created in Virginia, we have a new governor. 
and we have a new legislature. And these policies are being walked back, and Tanner Cross has been returned to his work. So it's not quite 1935 America yet. We can still fight back, and these brave people who refuse to lie are the ones who lead. God bless them. So, you know, this whole idea that you've got to call a boy a girl and a girl a boy, if that's the identity the parents choose for them or if uh, they choose it themselves, and they're encouraged to, to make these choices because they're given this perverse literature. I mean, in grade school, there, and um, one of my wife's friends <clears throat> was accosted by a neighbor who, who came over and angrily demanded that she and that her children apologize to her daughter because her daughter now thought that she was a boy. And this woman insisted that my wife's friend's children uh, use the new pronouns and now call Jill Jack and so forth. You see, it's not, the, it's not the state police necessarily or the school board who move in on you, it's your neighbors whose minds have been conformed to the construction of the dream reality which they insist on imposing on everyone around them. Because by the way, that's the only way the dream reality can survive. Napoleon made the famous remark, I must conquer to survive. Why? Because he was an illegitimate ruler. He came to power through a coup d'etat. He knew he was illegitimate, and he knew that what legitimacy, the, the, the simulacrum of legitimacy he could give himself was through successful conquests. So he would never stop, and he couldn't. I must conquer to survive. This perversion, inversion of language must conquer to survive. They have to keep pushing, they have to insist that you participate, you join the lie, otherwise some kid like Tanner Cross is going to stand up and blow them away by t speaking the truth. It's, you know, the, you've got to, con think of all, this is how far it's gone. Consider the chemical castration of a child. Think of a parent who would do that to their ch child. Think of a school that would approve and encourage that it be done and insist on conformity from the other children going along with the program. Think of a doctor who would perform this. And you see, all those sectors of society have been already infiltrated. Well, I guess I've gone on too long. Is that, <laughs> Kevin, I didn't know that's the way you did it here. <laughs> but I, I, I get the point. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to wrap this up. Uh, you know, so you, you, anyway you see, the rod is so deep. I need hardly tell you that the media is on board, that the corporate uh, gurus are on board, that the educational system is on board, um, the military is on board. I'll tell a story out of school, I won't name the officer to whom I'm referring, in the US Marine Corps, but I said, how does this stuff go, go over there? Um, and by the way, the US military ne never left Obama land under Trump because the adjutant in, in his unit, uh, following the guidance of Simone de Beauvoir, had her breasts removed and whatever other horrible surgical deformations to, to return as, as supposedly as a man with the requirement that now she would be referred to as he and so forth, paid for, of course, by the Navy Department, US and you and the taxpayers. Um, but so I asked, well, who, you know, how does the, how does it break down as to who's with the, the alphabet of disorders and who knows there's something wrong here? And he answered, it's not so much a matter of officers versus enlisted men. The demarcation line is between 
who's had a college education and who hasn't. The people with college educations, they're with the program. They don't see a problem because they've all been educated beyond their intelligence. The people who haven't gone to college, you got to be kidding. This is crazy. They've kept their common sense and they know better. You remember the famous story of Abraham Lincoln saying, if we call a tail a leg, how many legs does a dog have? Five? No, four. Because a tail isn't a leg. Okay, now let's just give you, I don't know, how, how, how much time do we have? Well, what you say, I'm fine, but I'll watch the lights. <laughs> I think your microphone was still on. I compensated. <laughs> so here are just a few little examples. I mean, you, you are daily under assault from this kind of nonsense. Some of these are kind of cute, though. The New York City Health Department form for new parents requesting birth certificates, asking whether the person giving birth is male or female. <laughs> huh? I mean, where's Lewis Carroll when we need him? This is really good. Now, there was a little brouhaha over the holiday season um, when I, an advertiser pulled an ad from this uh, company uh, called Zola, which was, you know, in the holiday season had uh, advertisements, I forget whether they're selling cards or whatever it was, of what, you know, what could be more Christmassy than lesbians kissing under the mistletoe. <laughs> so the, uh, the Hallmark Network pulled those and there was a huge backlash, including from this organization, GLAD, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, it's one of the alphabet disorder organizations that promotes all of this nonsense. And the president of GLAD said she was thrilled by the reversal that they put those ads back on. Thrilled, she explained to CNN, quote, for my wife and I to try to explain this to our 10-year-old twins is mortifying, unquote. Well, the mortifying thing in this sentence is not only its grammar, <laughs> for my wife and I should be for my wife and me, but that's okay because Sarah could not possibly have a wife because she's a woman. And they could not possibly be our 10-year-old twins because only one of them could possibly be the mother and the other one could not possibly be the father. Where's dad? Well, you know, I'm never, uh, I have to take a drink before I mention his name. Um, our secretary of transportation, Buttigieg, or Buttigieg, how do you say his name? Buttigieg. So as you probably know that the Buddha judge took paid paternity leave, he and his quote unquote husband, James Gleesman announced were delighted to welcome Penelope Rose and Joseph Augustus Buttigieg to our family. Well, first thing you would notice that the family's a matriarchy because I, I later only discovered that Buttigieg considers himself the mother in relationship to, or the wife, I should say, the wife in relationship to quote unquote, his, her husband, this fellow Gleesman. But if Gleesman is the husband, why isn't Buttigieg named Gleesman? Rather, Gleesman takes Buttigieg's name, so that's a, that's a sign, it's a matriarch. So it's, okay, it's a matriarchy. Now the next question is, how could uh, Buttigieg, Buttigieg? Buttigieg? Buttigieg, 
You see, his name is never mentioned in my house. This is what, and also I don't have a TV, so I have no idea how anyone pronounces his name. Um, so Buttigieg um, can't be on uh, paternity leave because he's not a father. He's, he's pretending he's the mother. Should he be on maternity leave? And of course, the first thing to introduce these two guys with their adopted twins is of them in the hospital smocks in a hospital bed holding the twins. <laughs> Who stage managed that shot? I mean, it, to imply one of them had just given birth to them? I mean, what? So the, the, the optics of being photographed in the hospital, perfect for encouraging the delusion one of them gave birth. So this raises the question in both the examples I just gave you, well, in this one particularly, where's, mom, where's the mother? In all the celebrations of how wonderful this is, no one said, well, where's, where's mom? And under what pretext were these children taken from her? Was she just used as a breeder or what, exactly what were the... But nobody mentions mom. Mom has been canceled. Mom is a non-person. And what about, what about the father of the GLAD president's uh, twins. What happened to him? As you well know, because this has been going on for so long, it's not unusual for grown children like this, like what some, when Buttigieg's twins will be old enough that they will gain, gain access to the files and track down who their real mother was and who their real father was. And as we know, when that happens, the first thing the child asks is, where were you? Where were you? Why didn't you want me? That wound is there. They try to paper it over and pretend it's all part of the dream reality that's been created to do this. And of course, all of this nonsense happens only by excluding at least one of the parents. I have a lot of other uh, stuff here. Do you want to hear more examples or are you horrified or not? Are you, what? No more? You want some more examples? No, oh, all right. All right. Well, this is, I've, I've had some online encounters with uh, some homosexual interlocutors. And the, the, the dialogue is really uh, hilarious in a way, and it's a perfect illustration of the, the inversion of language in the dream reality that's created by these people to rationalize the way in which they're living. So I'm debating one homosexual. Oh, there's a film score with this. Lights, action. Oh, the camera, okay. So here I'm having an online debate with this homosexual and about the purpose of sex and procreation. And in this particular instance, the requirement of consummation for the establishment of the marriage. In, in civil law, it was always the case, it still is in some places, that a marriage had to be consummated before um, it, it was uh, established in law. That was never church law, but civil law, that was often the case. So I said to this fellow, homosexuals cannot physically consummate a marriage which means and has always meant coital sex. Isn't that obvious? How could you possibly deny it? Answer. You ask how anyone could possibly deny that homosexuals are unable to consummate a marriage? It's easy. The word consummate flexes a little, just as the word marriage has done. Consummation means something slightly different for a gay couple than for a straight one. Does it matter? 
Do we even need the word consummation in a gay marriage? I respond, so simply call a giraffe a donkey and voila, it becomes one, magic, just like homosexual marriage? Yep, that's more or less the way it works, except that there has to be widespread acceptance of the world's new or expanded meaning. Aha, have to conquer to survive. I say, so do you really think your redefinition of reality actually changes reality? If so, you are living in a magical world, and I don't mean Disneyland. Welcome to the world of Gnosticism and all its attendants, attendant spiritual pathology. Uh, well, according to my interlocutor, nothing has a purpose, and, and that's why he can do whatever he wants. And that, um, Homosexual acts really serve the same pur purposes as uh, heterosexual acts. So I said to him, but you obviously cannot deny that the purpose of the semen is to fertilize the egg. Yes, I can. Yes, I can deny that. I just did. Maybe it's hard to grasp, or maybe you're clinging to a popular, not a biological understanding of the word purpose. Oh, biological, oh, follow the science here. Here's another really, uh, uh, this is a really frank example. This was not in a direct dialogue, but someone criticizing my book on Amazon Here's what the fellow says. Where I disagree is with the traditional assumption that natural entities have inbuilt purposes. You know, like Aristotle says, has inbuilt purposes. This is a mere assumption, not something that has been discovered. The assumption results from projecting the way we create our own artifacts onto the creative activity of nature. Gee, just like the woman scientist in the tree. Without this assumption, the natural law case made against homosexuality fails. To support his argument, Riley would have to prove, all in cap letters, have to prove that this age-old assumption is the actual truth of living things. I would assert that this, that I would assert this to be an impossible task as living things are as ultimately purposeless as everything else in the universe. Unquote. Do you see? The purposelessness of things, that's the underlying metaphysics that allows for the Gnostic transformation into a dream world or a second reality, spelled out so explicitly by Simone de Beauvoir that there's, there is no human nature, right? So why not lop off the memories? And uh, why not support Joseph Stalin, as she and Sartre did? So he had to eliminate scores of millions of people. Those were, those were insects, right? By the way, Hitler admired Stalin. Uh, they, they learned, they fed off each other, and Hitler, convinced that he was going to win in conquering the Soviet Union, said he was going to create a, an estate for Joe and have a very comfortable place for Stalin in his retirement. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is all a matter of record. Well, listen, there are, there are, um, I, I'm going to leave some time, so I'm just gonna wrap it up here. It, all of this, this, this the, the extent to which this is gone, and it's gone very far indeed, doesn't mean these derangements will <coughs> succeed in the long run. Dream worlds do not last. Such dreams invariably turn into nightmares from which people eventually try to wake themselves. 
After all, reality still exists. It cannot be banished. Logos wins in the end. So it'll reassert itself one way or the other. How long it will take, how much damage these rationalizations will cause, that's up to us in a way. In other words, the counter principles must be confronted with the real principles of existence. Reflecting upon his experiences in Nazi Germany where he had been imprisoned, Heinrich Romnen, one of the great teachers of natural law, wrote, quote, when one of the relativist theories is made the basis of a totalitarian state, man is stirred to free himself, excuse me, stirred to free himself from the pessimistic, pessimistic resignation that characterizes these relativist theories and to return to his principles, unquote. Like him, we must stir ourselves. In respect to the issue of natural law and natural reason in our day and age, dear Monsignor Sokolovsky counsels, quote, we have to restore the very concept of natural ends. We have the means at hand to do this in our own country's foundation. They are called the laws of nature and of nature's God. I'll close with the words of Eric Vogler. Quote, the closure of the soul in modern Gnosticism can repress the truth of the soul, but it cannot remove the soul and its transcendence from the structure of reality. Unquote. The flight from reality cannot last forever. It will surely fail. We can help make sure it does by something as simple as telling the truth. Thank you. We do have time for a, a few questions. Um, I, I would just like to ask, ask you or maybe just make a comment. I mean, th to me, the, the, the problem with what's happening, what you've just described, is that we have lost, have we not, the ability to reason with one another. Because if we can't agree on what words mean, we can't really talk without somebody giving way as to the meaning of our words. And when I, you know, when I see this Canadian trucker thing, I'm thinking we're going to see more and more of this because those truckers can't talk to the government. You know, they're, they're just they're just talking different languages, and uh, I'm I'm seeing that in our country as well. Yeah, um, let's have some questions. Maybe identify yourself so we get to know who who you all are. You we know, of course. Preston Knoll, great presentation, Bob. Thank you, Preston. So. Um, the St. Thomas Aquinas shows the very first principle of philosophy is non-contradiction. Could you talk about that, please? Because it, <clears throat> I think that will help people to get a handle on how to deal with people who come at you with this thing. Yeah, the principle of non-contradiction. Well, first of all, I want to say the last time I saw Preston Noel was at the March for Life in Washington, D.C., where we recharged our batteries with hope for another year, because if you had seen those scores of thousands of people marching, it, it would have lifted your spirits and the number of young people. And contrary to uh, the angry leftist mobs that sometimes descend on Washington, one thing you experience in this march is the happiness of the people doing it. The other thing I note is that if a light turns red, they stop. You know, 80,000 people going, light turn, turn, up, up, stop. Can you imagine if that was a leftist demonstration? <laughs> tear, down the tear down the, yeah, tear down the stoplight. Well, Preston, you mentioned the principle of non-contradiction, which is simply that a thing cannot be and not be. It can't be and not be at the same time, in the same way, in the same place. So in other words, the boy can't be a girl. That would be a violation of the principle of contradiction. The, the integrity of reality and language rests on the principle of non-contradiction. 
I remember when I was still an undergraduate at Georgetown senior year, I was having a discussion with a classmate about um, morality and the foundations of morality. And he was very dubious uh, that morality was anything other than one's preference and so forth, and clearly a relativist. So I took it down to, I said, well, we, we have to base, if we're gonna continue the conversation, we have to base it on the principle of non-contradiction, which I spelled out. I said, that, that's irrefutable. He said, well, someday it may be shown not to. And I thought, well, that's the end of our conversation because you can't, you can't continue the conversation. I say this with sadness, but he died of AIDS. That's, he contradicted himself and had to pay the price, sadly enough, with his own life. As many of these people will and do, it's not a cost. The second reality is not cost-free. It costs, it costs lives. It ruins lives if it doesn't explicitly take them. So yeah, the, the principle of contra non-contradiction uh, will enforce itself sooner or later. Else? My goodness. Oh, there we go. <laughs> go ahead, Nick. Oh yeah, I, I agree. You know, I mean, that's the problem. The rationalization um, affects everything. You know, you can't lie just about one thing. You need an army of lies, and that army of lies needs a uh, conquest. And yes, it is affecting. It's of course it's affecting what can be said, and it's affecting what can be done. There is a great statement in here from Benedict the Sixteenth that I didn't have time to get to, in which he talks about the how the forces of social conformity exact a price uh, against anyone who uh, doesn't fall in line. So if you want to stand up and tell the truth, like brave Mr. Tanner, get, you gotta pay a price. And it'll be, it could be a social price. You'll be shunned by some of your associates, your friends. You may have to pay a professional price could lose your job if you don't go along with it. Um, so there, there are degrees of penalties that are being exacted. Certain professions won't be open to you. You know, they think of all of the uh, stunted lives behind the Iron Curtain, and I got to know some of these people. They had vocations as professional musician, many things that they were never able to fulfill because their dad had been a pastor. And therefore the communist government wouldn't allow them to go to school or follow their profession because anyone tainted with religion or some association with the bourgeoisie, you were a class enemy and you'd have to pay the price. So where we see something like that, you know, and I, you probably think I'm exaggerating when I bring up the communist and Nazi examples, but when that's why Victor Klemper's book is so valuable. It just didn't happen overnight, but you saw how it seeped in and how you couldn't turn anywhere without having the demand made of you that you accede to it. And that the costs of refusing grow higher. We're still strong enough, but you see, the, the, here's the big problem. I'm sorry if this is a, too long an answer, but it plays into what uh, Preston asked People will often uh, you know, mutter to you, I think this stuff is just nonsense. But they, they won't say it uh, in public 
not necessarily because they're cowards, but because they don't know how to. You know, they're not equipped with the, the arguments. They don't even know what... Someone asked me recently in a program uh, I was doing, because my, my la latest book is uh, America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding, how do we restore this, uh, the laws of nature and of nature's God? Well, my feeling is that most people would have no idea what, what you mean by those laws of nature and nature's God. What are they? Laws of nature? So can you just say, well, let's everybody read Cicero and we're going to be okay? I don't think so. I, my answer was the first thing to do is recover faith. This man, this, this evangelical Mr. Tanner had faith. He, had, he was a man of faith, so he found a way to speak out and was courageous to do so. And once you have that, you will find the way to argue and you'll find the words. I'll tell you, much of the time my wife and I were marching on uh, the, the pro-life parade, I fell in with the Missouri Synod Lutherans. <laughs> Lovely people. All had the light green caps and largely middle-aged crowds singing the sweetest song to Jesus. It was very beautiful, very touching. If only all Lutherans were that way. But there are our Southern Protestant brothers and sisters, time and again, passing pro-life legislation, that time and again, the state courts and federal circuit courts knock down every time they get up and do it again. They are indefatigable. They are our brothers and sisters. I mean, we're, I'll tell you the one thing you get the sense of in that March for Life, and other things related to this, as dour as my remarks seem tonight, we're winning. We are winning. We are going to win this. Yeah, I would just echo what uh, Bob said about the March for Life. Uh, has anyone here not gone to the march? Raise your hand if you have, just admit it. Well, do, b before it's too late, do it, because I'm telling you, it changes your life. It really does. And uh, it changes your children's lives or your grandchildren's lives if you take them along. Um, it's, just, it's just among the most remarkable things you can do. And uh, it's life changing. Uh, maybe just a couple more questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, identify, let's identify yourselves. So well, uh, I'm John. Uh, I was wondering why so much, why did these leftist groups, whether it's communism, national socialism, all these other agenda driven groups, why did they always want to use misnomers? You know, so I, they'll use the term lesbian. Like, I, know I, I coach a lot of guys who, in the summer, are college players, so they're coming from the college. And what it talks about Well, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, so, or, you know, with the Nazis, you know, we'll, we'll evacuate the Jews out of Egypt. Well, we were actually exterminating, you know, and the Jews were non persons. Why did they always use these misnomers instead of just saying, yeah, we just want to kill these people? You know, I mean, how come they can't be upfront about these things and about front their behavior? Well, because of people like you. I've read a, uh, I, I've, I don't know, well, this is a strange preoccupation during, since when the lockdown started, but I've been pouring through my broad library on uh, the late Weimar Republic and the rise of Nazism, and particularly I've spent a huge amount of time on the resistance to Hitler and those who were brave enough to actually attempt to do something about it. Uh, and, and of course, the prices many of them pay. Diaries, memoirs, letters, histories. Um, why didn't Hitler, he did everything he could to control the churches. He was outraged at the Archbishop of, um, sorry? Munster. Munster. Von Galen. I, of course, read a biography of the great von Galen, the Lion of Munster, who had the effrontery to give a series of sermons 
which were hand typed and copied and distributed through Germany denouncing the euthanasia program. So I think it was uh, Himmler uh, told Hitler they wanted uh, von Galen killed. Hitler was afraid to do it. He wanted to move even more powerfully against the Catholic Church than he did. He broke all the stipulations of the Concordat, broke all of them. But nonetheless, and of course he took some of von Galen's priests to concentration camps, some of them died just to teach him a lesson. But Hitler told Himmler and Goering, we've got to choose our battles, we're in a war. I can't afford to do this right now because of uh, the morale of the troops. And if we, we take out their bishops and, and their cardinals, we, we're gonna have trouble in Bavaria and the Catholic regions and there could be uprising, there could, and it's gonna destroy the troops' morale. So we'll take, the, we'll take care of the church after the war. And just do now, through the SS and Gestapo, what we have to, to, to keep them under control and to arrest the priests who aren't behaving. And uh, so that's what he did, though of course hundreds of priests were ended up in Dachau and Auschwitz and, uh, paid the price, and I, this is too long an answer, but do you, do you know the role that some of the courageous Jesuits took in the opposition to Hitler? Just amazing, terrifically courageous men who involved themselves in the civic opposition, and also Protestants, great Protestants von Moltke and others had them come into their circles because they had such an admiration for the Pope's pastoral letters on how to revivify Germany as a Christian society after the war. And one of them went to a Benedictine monastery with Dietrich Bonhoeffer for about a week. The problem with the Protestants, particularly the Lutherans, is they had, the, there was no justification for tyrannicide, as there is within the Catholic Church. And it's speculated at the, the abbey that uh, the Jesuit priest walked Bonhoeffer, of course, who was a brilliant man, through the moral justification for tyrannicide and why it was a morally good thing to do to kill Adolf Hitler. Um, I got way off base there. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, so the, I mean, they're necessary. You have to rename reality if you're going to change it. And you have to, that's why you have to insist on it. One thing that strikes me when I hear this discussion, and your question also, I remember during the anti war years, uh, opposition to the Vietnam War, the left was incredibly critical of the military for dehumanizing North Vietnamese. They were gooks, they weren't human. So it's not like the left doesn't know what it's doing when they see this, if, if it's done in the right direction, you know, they'll be extremely critical of it. If it's supporting what they're trying to do, not so much. So it's very cynical. And I, I, I think you're, you know, I, as I was sitting listening, I, was, I kept thinking to myself, what are we to do? What are we to do? And I think your answer was exactly on point. Tell the truth. And, and <laughs> just a plug for Catholic citizens, I mean, this is why I think it's so important for this group to do what it does, because we educate ourselves about these issues so that we can talk to people about them at, at an intelligent level and not just get into screaming matches or try and organize huge demonstrations. That's important too if we can do it, but we need to be able to talk one-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-two and so forth and just tell the truth. And uh, it's tricky, but it's fun. So I think we'll call it a day. Uh, I appreciate very much all your your attention and coming out today. Um, we'll certainly look into this venue in the future for uh, later events. And uh, I, I urge you again to go to the website. We have, we, we have um, speakers scheduled through, I think, June. Um, and we'll continue to add on as we progress through the year. But take a look at who's coming up and, and just mark, mark these dates on your calendar. It's always the second Friday of the month. Uh, the only thing that might be changing 
month to month as the venue, but keep track of it on the website. Thank you for coming out. Have a great week. Thank you.